Hello everyone, in this video we're going to derive an expression for the capacitance per unit length of a pair of parallel cylindrical wires or equivalently a pair of line charges and this is going to be an approximate expression as you can see I've written down that we're assuming that D, which is the separation between the centers of the wires marked at the top of the screen there, uh, is much bigger than A which is the radius of each individual wire uh, themselves, right? So we're assuming the wires have the same radius and that the separation is much bigger than the radius. I'll be treating the more exact case where we don't have to make this assumption um, in the next video. So a good place to start would just be the definition of capacitance. So capacitance C is of course defined as charge Q uh, per unit voltage V Q over V. However, remember that we're really finding the capacitance per unit length here, right? We're dealing with wires um, which are going to have more and more ability to store charge the longer they are. Uh, and so my C here is not really capacitance, it's capacitance per unit length. So I'm just going to divide the numerator um, Q by the length of the wires, which I'm going to call L. And we could write Q over L as a single parameter, usually called lambda, uh, the linear charge density. So lambda um, divided by potential difference. So let's just annotate the diagram and say that there is a linear charge density of lambda on the wire on the right. It doesn't really matter which one, but let's just go for the one on the right. And um, assuming that our system is neutral overall, right, uh, then the wire on the left hand side must have an equal and opposite linear charge density minus lambda. So the main challenge really is going to be finding expression for this potential difference v in terms of the geometrical parameters a and d. And the standard way to do that is first find the electric field and then integrate that to get the potential difference. So to find the electric field, we can treat each wire or each line charge separately. Um, so let me just write down from, from each individual wire. Uh, you can get the electric field using Gauss's law. Imagine drawing a, a cylindrical surface centered on one of the wires. Um, of radius r. So maybe I can just define my radial coordinate and sort of um, imagine setting up a cylindrical polar coordinate system whose origin is at the base of this wire on the right hand side over here and the radial coordinate just sort of goes outwards uh, maybe I can do that as a straight line goes outwards and I'm going to draw it going towards the left here uh, and it's just the distance from the center of, of that wire. Again it, we could have defined it from the wire on the left but um, I just happen to choose the one on the right. And so if we draw a cylindrical surface, uh, it's going to have a circumference of 2 pi r. And because we uh, want the charge per unit length, we can just take a cylinder of unit length, right? And so if the circumference of the cylinder is 2 pi r and it has a unit length, then its curved surface area is just 2 pi r times 1, which is still 2 pi r. And so when we do our uh, integral for Gauss's law, surface integral of electric field, we just get 2 pi r um, times electric field, which I'm going to call E. And that is supposed to be equal to the enclosed charge divided by epsilon naught, just quoting Gauss's law here. The enclosed charge in a unit of length is, of course, lambda, and then we just divide that by um, epsilon naught, and then rearranging that you find that you get a 1 over r type field, an electric field, due to one of the wires, it's lambda over uh, 2 pi epsilon naught r. I'll just mention at this point, because it's not obvious, however, we have already used our assumption that d is much bigger than a. The reason why we've had to use that is we've assumed, when we applied Gauss's law up here, we've assumed that the field due to each wire points radially outwards. Now, if the charge is uniformly distributed over the surface of each conductor, then by symmetry that will be true. However, if the wires are close to each other, they're going to be, the charges sort of on, on one of the wires are going to be interacting by the electrostatic force uh, with the charges on the other wire, and they're not necessarily going to distribute themselves um, evenly. And in fact, I guess you can see intuitively that you would expect a higher charge density um, on the sides of the wire that are facing each other compared with the sort of outside parts of the wire. And so the charge density is not in reality going to be uniform, um, which is why this is, is only an approximate expression. But the, the further away the wires get from each other, of course, the less the charges are going to be interacting with each other and the more uh, radially symmetric the field becomes. Now, because the electric field E as a vector 
is minus the gradient of the potential v, um, we want to go the other way around, right? We want to get v in terms of, uh, well, we want to go from e to v, and so we have to do a line integral because that's the opposite um, of uh, sort of the gradient operator. And so we can write down v is uh, some kind of integral. Now I'm going to leave out the minus sign. Remember, e is minus grad v. Um, the reason we don't really need it here is because the v in your capacitance definition is just the magnitude of the voltage. We don't care whether it's positive or negative. So we're just going to leave out the minus sign so that it comes out positive and we don't get a negative capacitance. Um, and the thing that we're integrating is just the electric field, right? So we've got a lambda over um, 2 pi epsilon naught r. We are integrating um, just over the region between the two wires. If you have a, a conductor in equilibrium, remember there is no electric field inside the conductor because the free charges, the electrons just uh, move around, they redistribute themselves um, until there is no electric field inside anymore. So we don't have to worry about any potential electric field inside the wires themselves. So we just integrate from A um, up to D minus A, um, which is the position of the, the inner surface of the, uh, the opposite wire, right? So when we do this, we integrate the electric field due to the wire on the right hand side, but we also have to add on another contribution from the electric field um, coming from the wire on the left. Now, if you think about it, both electric fields assuming lambda is positive, both electric fields are going to be pointing to the left in that middle region, because the right-hand wire is pushing away positive charge towards the left, while the left-hand wire is negative, so it's pulling the positive charges towards it. Um, so we get a plus sign here as opposed to a minus sign, the fields are in the same direction. And the expression we get looks almost the same. It's going to be lambda over 2 pi epsilon naught, but the distance is no longer r, it's now d minus r, because that should be the distance from the center of the wire on the left-hand side. And then we integrate that with respect uh, to our radial coordinate r. Um, we can simplify this a little bit by pulling out a constant of lambda over 2 pi epsilon naught. And then the integrand is just 1 over r plus 1 over d minus r. It's with respect to r, and uh, we keep our limits there. Now, each one of those terms integrates in a straightforward way. Uh, let's keep our prefactor lambda over t pi epsilon naught. Integral of 1 over r um, is just natural log of r. Okay, r is positive by definition, so we don't have to worry about minus signs. Um, now, the 1 over d minus r bit is going to integrate to minus log of d minus r. We need the minus sign here from the chain rule, basically, because of the fact that if you differentiate log of d minus r, then you would get an extra uh, minus sign from the chain rule because the coefficient of r is negative, it's minus one, right? So we put this minus sign here from sort of the reverse of the chain rule and just put the limits on the end there. Um, we can make a further simplification by using our laws of logs. Um, and when we subtract the logs, you divide the arguments of the logs. So it's natural log of r over d minus r like that. And again, same limits, right? So now we just have to plug the limits in, subtract them from each other. So, right, we've got lambda over 2 pi epsilon naught. When we plug in r equals d minus a, our upper limit, we get log of d minus a. And then this bit here, the bottom of the, uh, the argument of the log is now d minus d minus a. D's cancel and you just get a. Um, when we plug in a, Instead, that straightforwardly gives just a over d minus a. Um, now, there's a few ways you could approach this uh, this next step, I guess. What I'm going to do um, is use the same law of logs where you divide the arguments. All right, so you can combine these into a single log and say it's lambda over 2 pi epsilon naught, natural log of. You're going to divide all of this by all of this, but those are reciprocals of uh, of each other, right? So if you do d minus a over a divided by a over d minus a, that is just going to give you d minus a over a all squared, right? So we can put log of d minus a over a all squared, and then use yet another law of logs to pull down this power as a, uh, a prefactor um, to your log. So your potential difference v is now just lambda over pi epsilon naught. There is no 
two anymore because we brought down the power from the log. Lambda over pi epsilon naught uh, natural log of d minus a over a. And then there is just, um, I guess, we can make yet another approximation since we already assumed that d is much bigger than a um, when we were thinking about the symmetry of the electric field. We may as well say that d minus a is um, roughly the same as just d. And so we can write this as lambda over pi epsilon naught uh, log of d over a. And then we just go back to our definition of capacitance. We have to do lambda over that entire thing. So lambda over all of that. Um, of course, when we divide, the lambdas will cancel. And then we just flip the rest of it upside down because we're dividing. So your capacitance is going to be roughly pi epsilon naught divided by natural log of d over a. And we have succeeded in deriving our approximate expression. Now, in the next video, I'll show you how to derive the more exact um, exact expression, which doesn't assume that you have uniformly distributed charges. Um, it involves the method of images, and it's quite interesting. And uh, so I hope to see you again soon for that video.